All right, we'll get started. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the American Enterprise Institute. I'm Yuval Levin. I'm Director of Social, Cultural, and Constitutional Studies here at AEI. And it's my great pleasure to welcome our friend Rich Lowry to discuss his important new book, The Case for Nationalism. Uh, Rich is, of course, the editor of National Review, maybe the flagship magazine of uh, American conservatism for decades. Uh, he's edited it since 1997. Rich is also a syndicated columnist and author. I very much recommend to you his previous book, A Study of Abraham Lincoln's uh, Social and Economic Thought, called Lincoln Unbound. Um, and this new one, of course, speaks to a very live and significant controversy in our politics, um, a subject that's been... Uh, uh, a, 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 an area that's been a subject of an enormous amount of thought and argument in the last few years, the question of nationalism of the nation, its place in our politics, its connection to some of the forces and threads that have been driving the politics of the West uh, in recent years. Um, our format will be very simple. We'll hear from Rich a little bit about the book. Uh, he and I will then uh, discuss it for a few minutes, and we'll open it up to questions from you. Uh, so please, let's welcome Rich Lowry. Thank you all. Thanks, Jake. Thank you, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks so much for making the time. I'll share with you what's been my um, favorite moment from um, my book tour so far. It came very early on, I think on the second day. It was an NPR interview. And NPR has this practice I like to think of as professoring. So what they do, they'll have you on as a conservative. And you'll give your take on history or policy. And then they'll have a professor on, like in the middle of your presentation or right at the end. And the role of the professor is to say basically that you're an ignoramus and a lout, uh, but say it in dulcet tones. And a NPR listener instinctively believes anything that is said in a dulcet tone by a person uh, with some authority uh, and some credentials. So you're therefore officially deemed an ignoramus and a lout, and everyone can go home happy. This is sort of like, uh, it's the NPR equivalent of what happens in a Jerry Springer show when the baby mama comes on to confront the father. It's what everyone's been waiting for, right? So I had this uh, extensive pre-interview uh, in preparation. It must have lasted two days uh, in preparation for this NPR program. And I really appreciate how much care they take with it. So everything was set to go. And the morning of, they're desperately trying to get in touch with me. You know, what, what is it? What do you want? And they're like, Rich, we want to know, is it OK if we have a professor on with you? I was like, OK, you know, I know what you're doing, but it's fine. You know, it's fine. You can have a professor on. So I, I'm going with the, the interviewer for a while. And clearly, her head is basically uh, exploding. She can't believe what I'm saying. You know, I, I say uh, the basic propositions of nationalism are, are so um, uh, basic, really, that, that most people, when you scratch the surface, are a nationalist in some form or other. And she's saying, are you really saying that uh, nationalism is not necessarily synonymous with hatred and big, bigotry? I'm saying, I told her, I'm saying more than that. I'm saying nationalism really gave us modern democracy. And she's like, OK, let's go to the break, and we need to hear from the professor. And they bring on the professor, who totally to type, uh, idiosyncratic, sophisticated way of talking a uh, foreign accent. She was originally from Russia. And after some preliminaries, uh, she says, you know, everyone in the modern world is a nationalist. In fact, nationalism created modern democracy. And you can see the host. She, she can't believe it. She's taken aback. And she says, wait a minute. Are you agreeing with Rich Lowry? And it uh, turned out, in this case, NPR had not done sufficient research because the professor is a woman named uh, Leah Greenfeld who is an extraordinary uh, scholar of nationalism. And it turned out I had read her, um, her, her most important book prior to writing a word on my own. It's called Nationalism, uh, Five Paths to Modernity. So I had to interrupt and say, you know, actually, you know, she's not agreeing with me. I'm agreeing with her. You know? <laughs> her arguments are crucial to, to my thinking on uh, this topic. So at least this once, NPR had professored itself. And it was uh, very gratifying. Uh, to me, at least in a small-minded way. So let me give you uh, five propositions about nationalism. And then I'll sit down with you all. We'll talk and take any questions. So um, first proposition. Nationalism is very old. It's very natural. It's very powerful. 
Empires throughout the ages have tried to eliminate it unsuccessfully. Totalitarian ideologies have tried to eliminate it unsuccessfully. And just to give you an example of how old and deep nationalism, or at least national feeling, is, you can go to one of history's great monsters, Joan of Arc, right? In, in 1425, she has a vision in her father's garden from an angel that she is going to liberate France from the English. Now, the English kings at this time have a fixation with ruling not just England, but France. The English line originally comes from France, of course, or a province in France, Normandy. And uh, the English had been attempting to put an English heir on the throne of France. This precip precipitates the Hundred Years' War, uh, which is fought in France and is a debacle for the French. By some estimates, the population declines by half. It's ravaged by famine and disease and combat. And when Joan is born, uh, this has been going on for about 75 years. And it's had the aspect of a civil war uh, in France in addition to the English occupation. And because of a, a willpower that is difficult to fathom, she somehow convinces the French authorities that she should be able to pursue uh, this vision uh, and this mission that she has. And she ends up um, encamped with French troops outside of the city of Orleans. And she sends messages to the English troops. She says, I, I am a, uh, I'm a, I'm a warrior. I'm giving you a fair warning that I'm going to chase you all, one and all, from France. And if you don't leave, I'm going to kill you all. Just wanted to let you know. And then she sends more messages. And finally, she sends the last one that she shoots over in an arrow and says, look, I'm, I'm serious. This is my last warning. And the English troops obviously must have been you know, hard-bitten guys who uh, took this with about the seriousness that you would expect, completely scorned her and her messages, shout, shattered across the parapet, you know, insults at her, you know, more news from the French horror. And she takes this uh, the way an average teenage girl would. She's insulted and cries tears of outrage and shame. Then she does what no teenage girl in world history has ever done before or since. She leads the French troops into battle, riding a white horse, carrying a white banner with the image of Christ sitting in judgment, and chases the English from Orleans. And astonishingly enough, she succeeds in restoring the French heir to the throne. Now, her luck runs out at some point. She's betrayed by uh, French forces allied with the English. The English undertake a trial of her that, uh, as you might expect, is not very fair-minded. Uh, it's, it's all uh, based on finding her guilty. They spend an inordinate amount of time on the fact that she wore men's clothing. I think the whole trans thing would not have gone over very well in 15th century England, uh, judging by this. But they find her guilty. They burn her at the stake. She declares the name of Christ as she's going through this ordeal. And they spread her ashes in the Seine River. And she was 19 years old. And the point of this is there's going to be no more John, Joan of Arc. There's going to be no more memory of this bizarre incident. And in fact, as we all know, the opposite was the truth. Because Joan had become a symbol of her nation and of its independence, and as such, will not be wiped out throughout all of French history. The French king uh, annuls her trial in 1920. She becomes a saint. When the French are occupied by a much more hideous and uh, uh, evil occupier, centuries later, the Germans, what do the, does the free French army take as their symbol? The symbol of Joan, the cross of Lorraine. They paint it on their, their ships. They paint it on their airplanes. And when Charles de Gaulle himself, a formidable symbol of the French nation, dies, his village puts up a 60-foot cross of Lorraine at the entrance of the village in memory of him and in honor of Joan. That's nationalism and national feeling in a nutshell. Second proposition, nationalism is part of the mainstream of the American tradition. You get no American revolution without nationalism. There was an American nation prior to 1776, and the essence of the revolution was to say that nation had its own rights and claims and should govern itself. 
You wouldn't get the, rat the drafting and the ratification of the Constitution <clears throat> without the nationalism of Hamilton and Washington and like-minded founders who believed that we could not just be uh, a series of separate statelets vulnerable to foreign powers around us, vulnerable to being picked apart, and vulnerable to falling into disgrace. No, we needed a strong and capable national government. And of course, you don't get victory in the Civil War without nationalism, which is <coughs> uh, the main event um, underlining the legitimacy of the American state. So this tradition runs through Alexander Hamilton, who believes you should have strong, capable national government, you should have a strong military, especially a strong navy, and our country should become a, a great nation, a great power on the model of Great Britain. This tradition runs through Lincoln, it runs through TR. You can see uh, nationalistic symbols and sentiments uh, running through the 20th century through FDR and Reagan. FDR uses the Blue Eagle, of course, to sell the NRA uh, program. He is a, a democratic nationalist, a raid against Hitler in World War II. I defy anyone on any part of the political spectrum to read his third inaugural address. He had a lot of inaugural addresses. It's hard to keep track. But if you read the third one and, and not be moved by his sentiments about her, his nation or not be moved by his D-Day prayer, which Donald Trump read uh, on the anniversary of, of Normandy <clears throat> just several months ago that begins, our sons, pride of the nation, are now set out on a mighty endeavor. And that both FDR and Reagan had access to the uh, nationalistic sentiments and feelings and symbols just goes to how, how it's, it's a fairly plastic uh, phenomenon. Both parties and different ideologies have access uh, to it. And it can also obviously be abused by malefactors, as we've seen throughout history. Third proposition, America is not just an idea. One of my basic axioms in Washington, if there's something that both sides uh, automatically and thoughtlessly say, the way Joe Biden, he says America's an idea, Lindsey Graham says it, America's an idea, it's probably wrong, or you at least should be skeptical of it. America is not just an idea. No one lives in an abstraction. If you ask anyone, where are you from, no one in the right mind says, oh, I'm glad you asked. I'm from Locke's Second Treaties, Book 3, Chapter 4. Right? That's just not how it happens. Now, a more defensible version of this notion is that America is just about civic nationalism. That's all about equality and citizenship. And that's clearly a, a big part of our nation, but it, it doesn't represent all of it. And the problem I have with all arguments of this nature, I think they slight the fact that nations are thicker uh, than uh, just I ideas and ideals and they're, they're built on cultures. So the way I illustrate this point, if we take an example, a, a tourist hypothetical, and if you imagine tonight an African-American meeting a white American on the steps of the Paris Opera House, instantly, these two people, it doesn't matter whether they have different ideologies, doesn't matter if they're from different parts of the country, they instantly have more in common than anyone around them. They share a language so they can instantly communicate. They probably dress largely the same. They probably like largely the same food. They have the same founders, the same heroes, and an enormous stock of common cultural assumptions and references. To extend the tourism um, metaphors, tonight, if, some, if an American's at the uh, 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 beer garden in Munich, the Germans around him don't say, wait a minute, I see that guy. I think he believes in the Declaration of Independence. He must be an American. No, they say, he's loud, he's boisterous, he's friendly, he might be fat, he's an American. So these, these are uh, cultural markers that set us apart from other, other people and account for the fact that we have more uh, communication, easier communication and attachment to one another than to other people around the world. Third proposition, uh, sorry, fourth proposition related to the third, is just underlining the importance of culture and how important it was at the very beginning of uh, the settlement of North America. When the Puritans came to Massachusetts Bay Colony 
they brought with them the charter they'd gotten from the King of England uh, to govern themselves. They exploited a loophole. It really should have stayed in England, but they, there was a loophole that allowed them to bring it to our shores, which they wanted to do because they wanted the assurance of having this uh, document setting out their self-government in their own possession. They very quickly worshiped their own way. They very quickly established their own modes of government, not to the liking of the king, not to the liking of people around the king, who began to urge him, well, why don't you go back and take that charter? Why don't you go get it? And the John Winthrop, the governor, and others in Massachusetts Bay Colony had to consider, what are they going to do? What are they going to do if the king's going to come and get the charter? And they make the decision collectively, we will resist him by force. They um, arm uh, the harbor. They put a, a beacon on a high point in Boston to let people know if the royal ships are approaching. That hill today is known as Beacon Hill. And they drill their militia. So to me, this is just so incredible that 140 years before, a revolt against English royal authority led by independent-minded and stubborn people based in Boston, Massachusetts, there was nearly a revolt against royal authority centered in Boston, Massachusetts, led by independent and stubborn-minded people. And for me, this just goes to how deep the cultural grooves in this country uh, run. We can also talk about the Bible that has been so important to our history and to our culture. Initially, it was the Geneva Bible uh, that dominated uh, when they, they came over. It's sometimes referred to as the Breaches Bible because of the strikingly modest way it tells the story of Adam and Eve. It said, you know, they sinned, they realized they were naked, and they sewed together fig leaves and made themselves breeches. Um, but very quickly, it was the King James Bible that came to dominate. And obviously, it resonates throughout our history. It's been a, a, a great uh, fund of rhetoric down through the centuries. Uh, you often hear Martin Luther King quoted for the proposition that the Declaration of Independence is a promissory note that is yet to be, be cashed. He did say that. That's a very powerful sentiment. But the main element of Martin Luther King's rhetoric and what made it so powerful wasn't Thomas Jefferson. It was Amos. It was Jeremiah. It was Matthew. And it's from the Bible that we get key aspects of our national identity. One is that we're a chosen people, or as Lincoln said it more modestly and perhaps more appropriately, an almost chosen people. You get the idea that we're living in a promised land, and you get the idea of a covenant. Obviously, it goes back to the Old Testament. First covenant in our history is the Mayflower Compact. Then as settlers come, pretty much every time they found a new town, every time they start a new church, there's a covenant. There's a written document setting out uh, the rules and everyone's mutual obligations. And the most important covenant uh, in our country is what is the sheet anchor of our sovereignty, which is the US uh, Constitution, which gives us a strong and capable national government. It gives us a limited uh, national government. And it goes back to this notion of a covenant. Finally, uh, I'll just set out very briefly in capsule form what I think is a lowest common denominator uh, conservative agenda based on nationalism, which really focuses on our culture and preserving our cultural core. It means, one, defending zealously the English language as the dominant language in this country. If there's anything we know about cultural cohesion and national cohesion, it is that if you uh, get multiple languages, you're going to get a problem. Uh, even nice, pleasant Canada has been, uh, was a couple dec decades ago almost torn apart by the fact that Quebec is a French-speaking province plopped in the middle of an English-speaking country. You see the contention now in Spain over the status of Catalonia, which is based primarily uh, around the fact that Catalonians speak their own language and they have their own culture around their own language. We have to defend our founders and our heroes who are under an ongoing assault. It wouldn't shock me if there's not a Jefferson Memorial uh, 20 years from now. Uh, in Charlottesville, when you had the hideous uh, march by the neo-Nazis, there was an old church here in Alexandria, Virginia, where Robert E. Lee and George Washington had worshiped at some point. So they had a plaque 
marking Robert E. Lee and marking George Washington. They took down the plaque of Robert E. Lee because they considered it too divisive. I can see that. I think that's reasonable enough. They also took down the plaque of George Washington, which is completely insane, but uh, sort of is, represents the drift of the argument on, on uh, our founders and our national heroes. We have to defend our civil rituals and our national symbols, including the flag. One reason I am uh, so uh, irritated when people use the flag as a, a means of protest, disrespecting it, or the anthem that celebrates it, is because men died for that flag, not in a symbolic sense, but in a literal sense. If you go to the history of the Civil War, color sergeants carry the flag into battle unarmed as a rallying point for their uh, comrades and took this duty incredibly seriously. Multiple men died defending the flag in the Battle of Gettysburg, right around the spot where Lincoln gave the Gettysburg Address. In the Battle of Fredericksburg, one color sergeant was wounded, handed the flag over to another color sergeant who was wounded, who uh, took it to another officer so he could wrap it around himself uh, as he died uh, when he was grievously wounded. So these symbols go very, very uh, deep and part of our cultural uh, um, uh, inheritance. Finally, we need to teach our history. We need to be truthful about our history. Uh, yes, we have national sins, but that is not all that this country is about. We should not be teaching our history as a tale of unrelieved oppression and woe, but the glorious story of a free people living in a blessed land. And I'll just leave you with uh, one last quote, and then I'll conclude. Um, and this is a quote that I really think captures just how, how deep these cultural attachments are and how we all, even if we don't realize it, even if we want to look away from it, we all feel this about our country. It was given by a scholar named uh, John Thornton Kirkland, who went on to be the president of Harvard. And he said in the 1798 speech, we have learned to love our country because it is our country, because we are near it and in it and have an opportunity of being useful to it, because we breathe its air and share its bounties because the sweat of our father's brows has subdued its soil, their blood watered its fields, and their revered dust sleeps in its bosom. Because it embraces our fathers and mothers, our wives and children, our brothers and sisters. Because here are our altars and here are our firesides. Because patriotism is the combined energy of the social affections. And he who can tear it from his heart commits sacrilege upon his nature. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks very much, Rich. We appreciate that and, uh, and appreciate this book, which, um, w which steps into a very live controversy around this question of nationalism in our politics now and tries to organize it a little bit. The book is structured in, in roughly the shape that you laid out for us here, trying to lay out the idea of nationalism and then to think through its place in American history, its place in contemporary American life and the challenges it faces now. I guess I wonder first, uh, as, as an opening question, why you think nationalism is such a controversial issue now? Why is it understood to be so connected to the essence of this political moment? What it has to do with President Trump or Trumpism, whether that's why it's risen the way it has. Why is it that we're talking about nationalism so much at this point? Yeah, Donald Trump, mainly. Um, so the, the way I think about this, one, the book was occasioned by Trump. The, um, I hadn't really thought much about nationalism. I sort of shared uh, the lazy assumption that it's, it's a dirty word until Trump's uh, inaugural address, which got me thinking about it a little more uh, deeply. So I, I think what's happened is Democrats, although they, they have a nationalist tradition uh, in their not so distant past, totally turned their back on it, have gone towards a cosmopolitan progressivism and the Republican Party had also lost touch uh, with nationalism. I think under the influence of a libertarianism that values markets over borders, under the influence of a, um, a business elite that's a little more transnational in its orientation uh, than national. Samuel Huntington, the late social scientist, talked about how in the 19th century, you had business innovations and technological changes that created a national affiliation and a national attitude over and above local uh, attachments and local affiliations. In the late 20th and 21st century, 
that we've, the same kind of uh, technological innovations and business changes have created more of a transnational uh, attitude. And then finally, uh, George W. Bush's overly idealistic emphasis on his foreign policy. I think all that kind of um, meant that the party lost touch uh, with nationalism to some extent. So you had this, this kind of baton just on the floor. And Trump picks it up, you know, impulsively, instinctively, accidentally, whatever it is. Um, so that accounts for a lot of the debate. But it goes deeper than Trump because, you know, Brexit was a, a major event uh, that happened before um, the election of Donald Trump and uh, just goes to this question, are the, the EU, the potentates in the EU think that it's nationalism in the nation state that caused the agony of Europe uh, in the 20th century and those forces have to be effaced and subsumed into a, a neo-imperial neo project that has a, a dream of a united Europe, goes back to Rome, Charlemagne, Napoleon, Hitler even, obviously much more benign and mild for, um, version of it than, than those. And um, you know, Britain, when faced with the question, should some significant part of your sovereignty um, be run out of Brussels or should be run out of Westminster, answered Westminster. And that's a nationalistic answer and just goes to how this is a broader phenomenon than just Trump, even though Trump's obviously driving the debate. If Trump is driving that debate, does that mean that the case for nationalism has to somehow bear the burden of Trumpism? That you, you have to answer for some of the things about Trumpism that are what you want to suggest in the book are not nationalism or yeah. shouldn't be associated with nationalism? Yes, no, uh, definitely. So I think with Trump, if you get Trump on the teleprompter and um, you listen to some of the things he said at the UN, uh, some of the things he said uh, in Poland in his Warsaw speech, I think they're unassailable. I think they're, they're deeply true. Uh, his Poland speech, I believe, was the best speech of his presidency and advanced the idea that even though Poland sits in the, kind of the worst place you can in Europe and has been serially overrun uh, by foreign uh, occupying armies and uh, partitioned and, uh, over the years and subjected to the, the unspeakable horrors during the 20th century, Poland has never gone away because of... Um, what in essence, because the, the Poles are so Polish, and that's the essence of Poland. It's the, the one th common strain there might be between Rousseau and Trump, because Rousseau in the 18th century wrote at a time when Poland, surprise, was occupied by Russia, stick to your traditions, stick to your mores, stick to your culture, and they'll never be able to absorb you, and that has been completely true, and I think that's a deep and moving Truth. The problem, obviously, with Trump is once he gets off the teleprompter and he's in, in the wild, um, it's, not, it's nothing like this. And the, the, the unifying potential of nationalism is it's something above sect, it's above tribe, it's above race, it's above partisanship. And to say that Trump slights the unifying uh, potential of nationalism is an understatement. You can come up with many examples. Just two months ago, whenever it was, when he was briefly at war with the city of Baltimore, uh, you know, he tweeted, no human being would want to live in West Baltimore. And the fact is, human beings do live in West Baltimore, and they're not just human beings, they're Americans. And Donald Trump is the head of, the, head of state of the United States of America. And just too often, that does not uh, uh, seem to make any impression on him. Um, but I, I think, and that just in sheer political terms, a more nationalistic and populist Republican Party that's actually thought through uh, this, this aspects of a new agenda and integrated it thought, thoughtfully into its program would have more chance of uh, jumping racial lines than a more stereotypical Mitt Romney Republicanism would. I think they're um, African American, Latino, overwhelmingly males, middle class, um, working class who'd find this, this program and iteration more appealing, but you have to work at it and mm -hmm. very often Trump doesn't and does the opposite. Are these kinds of elements incidental to nationalism? Are they, is it a coincidence that they emerge with Trump? Don't they emerge when nationalism is out in the open in a lot of places and a lot of times? Yeah, I think they, they're incidental or should be incidental. The, the, I mean, the issue is they're caught up with populism, uh, which is a different phenomenon, and two, with Trump's persona and personality, which is a very different phenomenon. Um, 
But the, the populism and the nationalism in our age do tend to be uh, mixed in together uh, because the elite institutions tend to be so uh, hostile uh, to nationalism and the quote unquote respectable political parties tend to not want to have anything to do with it. So it, it leaves it to uh, populist outsiders to exploit. But I don't think this is inherent to nationalism. And you know, Alexander Hamilton, who I think is the taproot of the American tradition, was not a populist. He was opposed to the populist and paid a price for it. The populists were better at uh, small d democratic politics uh, than he was. Henry Clay, uh, Lincoln, you know, also exemplars of, of this tradition are in his line, also were, were anti-populist. But with, with uh, Trump, if you're making 19th century analogies, he, he's more in line with you know, an Andrew Jackson than a Whiggish Abraham Lincoln. In, in talking about the first of your propositions there, you said nationalism or national feeling has deep roots. Is nationalism just national feeling? What actually is it? What kind of thing is nationalism? Is it a, is it a sentiment? Is it a, an ideology, a way of thinking about politics? Yeah, so this is, uh, uh, you get into the definitions, where it's kind of in loose conversation. People tend to think, well, patriotism, that's everything that's good about national feeling, and nationalism is everything bad. But if you're going to be technical about it, patriotism, the roots patre, uh, same root is patriarchy, father, fatherland, loyalty to your own. Nationalism is the idea that a distinct people bounded by a, a common culture, common language, common history should govern a distinct territory. Um, but the, these uh, patriotism and nationalism, it is caught up you know, with, with one another. And in loose conversation, they should be uh, interchangeable. And it, you're going to be, if you're zealous about your sovereignty and governing a distinct territory, you also probably have a, um, a, a, a really strong uh, sense of uh, community or ideal community with everyone else that's in your people. So the patriotism and nationalism sort of mix together. But you think it is ultimately a, a sort of feeling about community. It's not a way of organizing politics, or is it? A way of thinking about world affairs. The, the term nationalism, especially in the kinds of debates we've had on the right in the last few years, has served all these purposes, yeah. right? It's, it's been a, a, a concept of foreign policy thinking, uh, which is largely the role it plays in Europe. It's been a way of thinking about domestic affairs, nationalism as opposed to localism, say, which I take it is not quite what you're saying. It's also sometimes just equated with patriotism. And then you say, well, how can you not be for nationalism? Right. That's so I think there, there's a certain lowest common denominator nationalism. That means you're focused on putting your people's interest first. Um, you're focused on preserving your sovereignty and pursuing your national interest in foreign policy. Now, that doesn't give you a policy answer to anything. And it's a mistake, I think, to, to say, well, I'm a nationalist, therefore I oppose the Iraq war. Or I'm a nationalist, therefore I support uh, the Iraq war. It, it doesn't give you the answer on what policy best serves any of these ends. But there are schools of thought, you know, cosmopolitan progressives and libertarians, who think there is something small-minded or too constricted in saying we're going to be focused on our people's interest above all other people's. We're going to be focused on our sovereignty and our national interest. So, you know, 80% of uh, Americans, you shake them awake at 3 a.m. and you put this proposition to them, should we be in favor of our own interest <laughs> you know, and our own people? They say yes. But there is that 20% that or whatever it is who has a philosophical uh, commitment that is at odds with nationalism. And you know Bernie, Bernie Sanders is an example. There's a, I talk about this in the end of the book. Famous interview he did with Vox in 2016, where the editor of, Ez, uh, of Vox, Ezra Klein, says to Sanders, "You know you're in favor of helping poor people. Isn't it true that the best way to help poor people around the world is just to let them all come into the United States? Which actually that is a truthful proposition. There, there's no doubt that would be better for for uh, all the immigrants coming in. But he's like, no." No, no, <laughs> that's a Koch brother proposal. We can't do that. You know, it's our people, our workers that matter uh, more to us. So that, he was, that was kind of beaten out of him, but that was a basic nationalistic sentiment. Mm. One of the striking things about this book is the way that you try to root the case for nationalism in the American story, in American history, in, in its various phases. And 
uh, among the more striking claims there is that American nationalism precedes American independence, that we existed as a nation before uh, we were a single political community, and in fact that it's rooted in, in English nationalism. How is it that our nationalism can be rooted in another nationalism, and what, what, what does it say about its character that that's the case? Yeah, so what I argue is that um, in the English Civil War, going way back, uh, th that was about whether the English nation uh, had an existence uh, over and above and outside the monarchy. So the, um, the Stuarts had this idea, a very traditional idea, that England was sort of their patrimony. It just kind of belonged to them. And what Parliament said was, no, it belongs to the people. They have their own rights and claims. So you have great contention uh, in England over this. You have the Civil War, um, which uh, topples the, the monarchy briefly. Then there's a restoration. And then eventually you get the Glorious Revolution, which in fine English style is just a, a really muddy compromise that, that works and, and everyone uh, gets around. But it does limit the power uh, of the crown. And what you have, to simplify terribly, is the people who were most vociferously and intensely on the side of parliament in that contention come here and bring all those uh, cultural assumptions and predilections and predicates to our shores. And they're, they're kind of folk memories and tropes uh, in this kind of version of English Protestantism that I think would give you a version of the American Revolution even without the Enlightenment. Enlightenment's a, a, a key part of it. Um, but at, as I say, before anyone had read uh, John Locke, you had people in Massachusetts Bay saying, no, we're going to govern ourselves. And I can't give you a date, but somewhere uh, between you know, the, the uh, early 17th century and 1776, you do have an American nation that has governed itself with its own institutions, its own uh, mores, ways of thinking, uh, separated by a vast ocean from England for about 100 years. And I don't think you get the revolution uh, if that wasn't the case. The revolution was about vindicating the rights of that nation. So why do you resist then the notion that America is an idea in a, in a general sense, that it's defined by a way of thinking about itself and about political life um, more than it is defined by a, a, a place or a language or, uh, uh, or, or an ethnicity or the other kinds of things that hold some nations together? Um, you're describing people unified by certain ways of thinking. Yeah, no, I think that's a good point. And I don't want to uh, give you the misimpression. I'm just saying ideals or how you think is not important. I would just make the case that, one, the how, how you think is caught up in your culture. Culture is seeded with ideas. So what I say in the book is if the eastern seaboard of the United States had been settled by Russians and you'd give them all you know, a, a copy of the Second Treaties and mandated they all read it like every single night, you still wouldn't have gotten the Ameri anything close uh, to the American founding. So that's one point. The second is that uh, the ideals, in my view, have been dependent on the success of this distinct bounded political entity, which is the American uh, nation. They've been dependent on its extent and its power. I mentioned in my opening remarks how you know, Washington and Hamilton and others thought if, if we just fell apart in disgrace soon after 1776, the whole experiment dies and the ideas die with it because they're discredited. And we wouldn't have been able to uh, vindicate our ideals and influence the world with them in the same way we did in the 20th century, which involved winning uh, two world wars if we hadn't been a continental um, nation. So the ideals, the way of thinking are important. They're just not the entirety of the story. And I think um, Republicans and even conservatives have gone way over uh, too far to, to emphasizing the ideals. Are we encouraged or should we be discouraged by the subject of your last book in doing this by Abraham Lincoln? Did Lincoln think America was an idea or is he, as I think you suggest in some ways in this book, a, a, a the, the embodiment of this other way of thinking about what America is, what nationalism is? Uh, he, he was both. And again, <clears throat> I don't think they're contradictory. And people have a, a misperception that nationalism somehow can't involve ideals or, or idealism uh, 
which is completely false. All nationalism is really kind of worth their salt, have some uh, I, ideal content. You know, when, when Joan was, was vindicating um, the French monarchy, the idea was the, the French had the most Christian king. And then after the revolution is that they have these ideals. The English imagined themselves leading the world in, in liberty. Ancient Israel, which I think is a, a proto nation, a very complicated uh, subject, again, that I simplify uh, greatly in my book. But the, the idea is we're a light, they were a light unto the nations. So the best nationalisms combine the particular with the universal. And I think Lincoln did that in a particularly uh, inspired uh, way. But it was, at the end of the day, the, the most important mission was saving the nation state. Now, in part, because he, he thought there was a logic to liberty to the American nation state. And, you, and if you saved it, and you know, sl slavery still existed in the South in some extent, it would still be overrun uh, by this, this logic. You know, and he loved uh, Henry Clay as beau ideal of a statesman, as he said once. And as Lincoln said, Clay loved America, uh, be one, because it was free, and two, because it was his country. And both of those are, are important. And there's a note, as I mentioned my opening, of modesty to, to uh, Lincoln's statements about America. But as one uh, historian archly observed, never once is there any suggestion on the part of Lincoln that God would actually countenance a divided United States of America. Lincoln said in, his, in the eulogy of Henry Clay that Clay loved his country because it was his country, but mostly because it was a free country. Did Lincoln love America mostly because it was a free country? Um, he loved mostly. Um, it was a huge element, and that it provided the opportunity for people to rise. Um, but the freedom wasn't going to be defended, uh, preserved, obviously, if the country, if the nation state was torn apart. So mm -hmm. I'd revert again to the argument that the two are innately yeah. connected. And, and, the, and kind of creating the opportunity or better, furthering the opportunity of people to rise in his, his view was also connected to a nationalistic economic and political program uniting the, the country with railroads, with canals, um, and uh, creating a national market when there have only been local markets. In, uh, in 2009 or 10, President Obama got in a lot of trouble on the right for saying that, sure, Americans are patriots and have American patriotism, and the Greeks have Greek patriotism, and the Belgians have Belgian patriotism, and that's great. And that was treated as a, as a failure to understand what, was, what, what really mattered about America. I was struck in reading your book that maybe you would defend Obama more than most on the right in saying that, that a, a, a nationalist actually appreciates the nationalisms of other nations. Yeah, I think uh, conservatives were too hard uh, on him about that. The Greeks do love their country. And if I, if I were a Greek, I'd love my country. <laughs> but I'm an American, and I think it's also objectively true. We're the best of all nations. <laughs> so um, that doesn't mean they can't have their, their patriotism, and um, we shouldn't <clears throat> uh, honor it. And you know, this is a, we haven't talked much about foreign policy, but this is obviously like a key element of the consensus of American policy in the 20th century was buttressing free, independent, and hopefully over time, small d democratic nation states. And one reason I, I think we've enjoyed, knock on, knock on wood, a relative period of great peace you know, the last 50 years internationally is the success of establishing uh, that norm, which has cut against you know, wars of territorial aggrandizement and created a more sacrosanct uh, sense of borders and a greater sense of legitimacy around uh, the nation state. And just one last point on this. You know, people tend to think, well, a nation state, that's war. That's where we get militarism from. But there's no form of human organization that's not deeply flawed because we're fallen people. So you go subnational to tribes. Tribes are not peaceful. Uh, tribal wars are, are not uh, in, anything to be taken lightly. You know, they're very often wars of extermination. You go higher. Uh, to empires, you know, um, empires fought wars. You know, Rome only closed the gates of the Temple of Janus or whatever to indicate uh, peace for several years in its uh, history. 
And <clears throat> the, the problem with empires is that someone has to rule. Uh, someone with a dominant language has to rule. Someone with a dominant culture has to rule. All the other nations caught up in it. So you know, the Habsburg Empire had a pretty good run. 600 years in the middle of Central Europe, as soon as a coercive apparatus uh, gives way, the nations are going to go their own way and want to govern themselves. Exact same experience with the Soviet Empire in the 20th century. Same experience with Western colonial empires in the 20th century. People who feel connected to one another and a common culture and a common language are going to want to govern themselves. It's just a, a basic, natural part of human nature. Where does this kind of thinking in American politics leave the question of federalism or localism? Nationalism, including some of the nationalisms that you describe in the book, Teddy Roosevelt's or progressive nationalism, uh, sometimes has understood itself as opposed not so much to globalism, as you want to suggest, but to localism. Um, is nationalism opposed to localism? Is nationalism a way of saying we need to have one American way of doing everything we do? No, I don't think rightly understood. Um, Teddy Roosevelt, I think the presidency <clears throat> is, is fine. It's the you know, progressive phase afterwards where you get this overweening mm -hmm. uh, nationalism and you know, he's giving speeches with people standing on tabletops waving red banners. And that's never a good sign. Um, but uh, I, I think proper nationalism needs to be rooted in the United States Constitution, which creates a national government, but also... Uh, uh, creates a, a system <clears throat> of dual sovereignty that, that allows a, an enormous amount of leeway to states and localities. And you know, I think having distinct local uh, cultures within limits is, um, is part of the American way. I wouldn't want like, an entire region of the country to be speaking another language uh, that would tear at our national uh, cohesion and uh, uh, just represents something that has to be avoided at all costs. Mm -hmm. how, does, how does a nation that is held together by this kind of national feeling deal with the darker sides of its own history? One of the ways that nationalism is controversial now as a political idea is that it strikes some people as mm -hmm. ignoring or overlooking uh, America's national sins. Yeah. Whether that's its treatment of Native Americans and the nationalist expansion, whether, of course, it's, it's the race question and slavery question, which are not just historical questions, but also contemporary questions. What, what does nationalism have to offer us in thinking about those kinds of, of challenges? <clears throat> well, a truthful history, one, which does mean acknowledging our, our sins, <clears throat> excuse me, but it doesn't mean telling lies about ourselves either. And the 16 pro 1619 Project, the New York Times, which has created, created such a greater uh, emphasis and interest on this question, there's an element of it uh, that I think is, is profoundly true and moving. The lead essay in the New York Times series um, described uh, the author, you know, as a little girl, and there was a teacher who had a well-meaning project, innocently intended, where she wanted the kids to come and point out on the globe what country they are from. And because she and her African-American friend were so American, they had no idea where to point. There was nowhere for them to point. And um, it's, if you take um, sort of the average African-American family, um, aside from you know, families that immigrated recently, the last 20 or 30 years, they have a lineage in this country going way back, uh, much further than the average European-American, uh, certainly much further than any of the neo-Nazi marchers in Charlottesville. So African Americans were part of the cultural nation uh, from the very beginning and made extremely important contributions um, to it. And that has to be acknowledged. Uh, conservatives should uh, be fully cognizant of, of this and I think focus on this in a way um, that we haven't. But I think in the sweep of American history, it was the nationalists who vindicated the rights of African Americans. It was a bogus sense of states' rights. It was a spurious national, uh, uh, Southern nationalism that uh, were advanced as a way to continue chattel slavery and then the subsequent uh, repressive Jim Crow system in the South. But we shouldn't lie about ourselves. And I, I think that's the, the other side of the coin of the 1619 Project. It says that the American Revolution was about slavery, protecting slavery. It just was not. It skips over the whole fact that uh, after 1776, you had a great loosening uh, in the North. Um, you had gr 
northern states, almost all of them, all of them uh, embracing gradual abolition, even had a loosening in the south. Now there's backsliding of the 19th century, which is a, a, another story. But it's, it's very unusual to have a people who want to lie about themselves. Usually what you do, you lie about the other guy, right? So uh, the French lie about the Germans. Not that they have to tell many lies to make them look bad. The Germans <laughs> lie about the French. It's something uh, new and unusual to lie about yourself and to want to tear down your own legitimacy. And I think this, this goes to how cosmopolitan attitudes have seeped into the American elite and how we have a, a denationalizing elite in important respects, which is kind of an unprecedented thing in human history. How do you explain it? Um, <clears throat> I think it's uh, some of the, the um, business and technological changes we've talked about have created a, a greater a transnationalism. Cosmopolitanism used to be the attitude of the outsiders of society, the agitators, Diogenes, the, the first uh, recorded human in history to say, I am a citizen of the world, lived in a uh, pot, pot, supposedly, uh, outside in the Athens marketplace to kind of shock the respectable people of, of the time. And that attitude in the beginning of the 60s and the 70s in this country has seeped in um, to the elite. Uh, then you have a, a focus on identity politics, which underlines subnational uh, loyalties. So you, you put them all together, and I, I think you have uh, our nation and its coherence under threat in a way it hasn't been before. Do you worry at all that nationalism contributes to a different kind of identity politics, to another way of approaching our political life through the lens of, of essentially identity rather than idea? Um, I don't think nationalism is identity politics. I think it's the opposite of identity politics. I don't think it's tribal. I think it's the opposite of tribalism. I think it's only from the purported perspective of citizen of the world that you can look at someone having national loyalty and say that's, that's small-minded. Um, it's not. And if you look at the places around the world that have uh, last three or four decades have most lacked nationalism or national feeling, you know, it's in the Middle East and it's in Africa, in part because of colonial legacy, in part because of the artificial borders drawn uh, for these countries uh, by colonial rulers. And it hasn't been unifying, it hasn't been wonderful, it's been the worst. Uh, it's been uh, worse, because you have no demos, you have no uh, mutual sense of uh, obligation and duty, and you have real tribalism, which tears people, uh, countries apart, and makes it impossible to have the social trust that lubricates democracy and capitalism. Let's open up for some questions, see what folks in the room uh, think and are interested in. Uh, all I ask is that you tell us who you are, and please do formulate your question as a question uh, to Rich, uh, and as a question about his book. Uh, we've got a couple of microphones going around just to make sure we can all hear you. Um, why don't we start uh, right there? Hello, uh, my name is Michael. I'm an intern here in DC. Um, so, question is um, do you think nationalism helps or harms people who want to move voluntarily from one place to another? Uh, if it helps them, why? Uh, and I think it's also important to note that- To, to, another, to another country? Yes, between, between different nations. <clears throat> and according to a 2018 Gallup poll, 50% of the world's population, that's 750 million people want to emigrate, but can't. So uh, I, I don't think any country, uh, and, and this is the experience in the actual live reality of the world should stop people from emigrating. And it's, it's only totalitarian countries, you know, like Cuba or, or North Korea that actually do this. But because I think uh, nationalism, excuse me, is bound up in having a, a distinct people, uh, immigration policy and having borders and sovereignty, immigration policy I think is really implicated. And uh, again, my contention would, would be immigration policy should be good for the citizens and people who are already here. That, that should be the primary concern. And you can have a big policy dispute about which, whether that's what level that's true at. You know, some people would say it's true at even a higher level than we are now. I think it'd be true at a lower level than we have now with a different mix and a different emphasis on skills. But um, a distinct people cannot stay the same um, if, if uh, they are um, overwhelmed um, by waves of immigration 
that are impossible to absorb and assimilate. And the traditional nationalistic focus in this country, is, um, you know, we saw, see this particularly in TR, is to put an emphasis on assimilation. And one reason that we were the, had a big wave in the early 20th century um, that was successfully absorbed is there was such an emphasis on assimilation. You had an incredible machinery devoted to assimilation. You had every elite institution in American life on board uh, with helping immigrants assimilate. And then you had the pressure of two world wars, a huge assimilating events. And then you had a, a pause uh, in immigration beginning in 1924, a law that uh, in some respects was ill-intentioned or a lot of people supported it for bad reasons, but did uh, create pressure on ethnic enclaves that had developed um, uh, on the immigrants to, to marry outside of their group. And that's ultimately what you should want. You should want Americans to be kind of all mixed up um, together and feel, have a mutual feeling as one rather than any sort of uh, enclaves developing. What would that look like now, an immigration policy that serves uh, the national interest or the interests of people who are here? Well, I think we'd recognize that we're at a different place than we were in the early 20th century when we had this great maw of uh, the American manufacturing economy that you could just plug immigrants into. I know the Ford Motor Company, I know about 40% of the guys on the factory line um, were immigrants. We have a different economy now, uh, more, uh, more based on technology and information and puts much more of an emphasis on skills. So my basic take is that many, many people want to come here for very good reasons, which gives us the opportunity to be a little bit choosy. And there should always be a humanitarian element. Uh, you know, there should be a refugee program. There should be, obviously, some allowance for family re reunification. But that said, there should be much more of an emphasis on uh, skills, I would put an emphasis on people who already uh, speak English, which does not mean you know, you're just having people come from Australia, not that Australians want to <laughs> immigrate to the United States, but you, know, you have millions, uh, tens of millions of people who already speak English in places like India and Nigeria. So let, let's get immigrants who <clears throat> will succeed here um, in economic uh, terms really quickly, rather than perhaps three generations hence, and because uh, we have so many people who want to come, again, we can choose, uh, we can decide to pick and choose. And again, to me, that just seems um, common sense. But for a lot of people, once you even say that, once you say it's our interest that should be driving it, you've committed some sort of offense and have uh, outed yourself as small minded. Let's uh, go to the back there. Thank you. Uh, Winston Wilkinson. Um, obviously, the, the president and his rhetoric has, has hurt <clears throat> this type of discussion. So in that mindset, how would you uh, advance this idea, your idea of nationalism in an environment where people just are offended by that, that word and what it means as it relates to the president and what's going on also in Europe? Yeah, I mean, it's a very good question. Um, I, I think, one, making the case that nationalism is a, a bigger phenomenon uh, than Donald Trump. It doesn't begin and end uh, with Donald Trump. And I want people who are Trump supporters to be able to read my book and say, okay, this is why nationalism is okay. But I also want people who are skeptical or opposed to Trump to read the book and hopefully uh, come to the conclusion that uh, this is an important thing and it should be integrated into any post-Trump uh, conservatism or Republican party. Um, that this, this, again, this is something that does not begin and end um, with a Donald Trump. And if I could wave a magic wand, you know, these are, there are things, many, many things he wouldn't say or do, but I am not equipped with such a wand, unfortunately. Right here in the front. Hi, uh, I'm Samuel Breslow. Uh, thanks for your remarks. My question, I was wondering, do you believe that the U.S. government, when making policy decisions about resource um, allotment or any other domain, should place more value on an American life than on the life of someone from another country? And why or why not? Yes, I do. So I, I think there's been kind of a, a lazy thinking on the right about trade, for instance, where we've heard, well, 
our trade ar arrangement with China is great because it's lifted a million, uh, you know, 100 million Chinese people out of poverty, which is a benefit. But I think the focus should be here in the United States. And if the cost of that benefit, you know, is 2 million Americans dunked into poverty and opioid addiction and other self-destructive behaviors, well, then it changes the equation uh, for me. So again, I think the, the focus should be on our own people and our own interests, not the ex to the exclusion of every humanitarian uh, initiative. You know, what President Bush did in uh, Africa and his AIDS initiative, would be, I think, is an example of a worthy humanitarian initiative that cost us very uh, little. But uh, uh, the, the focus has to be on uh, folks here at home. Right here in front. My name is Joe Freeman. I'd like you to say more about the South. I took a quick look at your index and didn't see it there. I thought I heard you say that Southern nationalism was spurious, which frankly sounds very wrong to me, having studied Southern history intensively and having come from several generations of Southerners. Now, I do agree that it was rooted in slavery. Slavery shaped the social, economic, political, and cultural systems completely in a way it didn't in the North, but that's why it became a a regional or nationalist culture in its own right. We have all these Confederate monuments as salutes to that nationalism, and I could go on and on and on, but just just say more, because I'm just surprised yeah. to hear you say that it was spurious. Yeah, so you, you heard me correctly. Um, I, I don't think there was, uh, you know, Lincoln's good on this in his first inaugural address, any real natural geographic boundaries. I don't think there was a, um, a, a truly separate national culture, you know, there was a distinctive regional culture, there wasn't a different language, there wasn't a different founding, and the basis of so-called Southern nationalism was explicitly the defense of a hideous uh, and unjust institution, and the fear that the South would be overwhelmed by a growing uh, North, both in terms of economic power and population, and that the national government, as it grew stronger, would impinge on this uh, institution. So I believe in the right of revolution, but <clears throat> which was what the uh, secession was, but it has to be a just revolution. And this was a revolution in a, a deeply unjust uh, cause. And uh, as far as the monuments, you know, I don't think they should be uh, sledgehammered in the middle of the night or spray painted or any of that. I think it's up to localities to decide, but you know, big, Confederate monuments, I'd prefer to see them uh, in museums or on battlefields, especially the ones that were erected at a certain point of time to send a message about the appeal and legitimacy of the so-called Southern nation and to send a message to African Americans uh, that it was going to get really bad for them. Um, so I, I, I do not, I'm not a fan of those monuments. Let's take another question uh, back here. Thank you so much for talking. Uh, I'm Dominic Pino, uh, George Mason University, and I'm taking a class about Edmund Burke right now. Um, reading Burke, it's impossible not to conclude that he loves Great Britain and he loves being British, um, but at the same time, he supported letting the American colonies go. Um, so do you think that his nationalism mm -hmm. is more what you're talking about in the sense that it's not militaristic? All right, well, you really put me on the spot asking an Edmund Burke question when I'm on the same stage with Yuval. And uh, I, I know very little about Edmund Burke, especially compared to Yuval. So maybe I'll defer to, to, to him <laughs> on that question. I'm just going to redirect the question to you. I, 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 you. You gave here what must be the most stirring defense of French nationalism ever delivered at AI. Um, and th that suggests a capacity for seeing as part of your own nationalism <coughs> the appeal of others' nationalism. And maybe also suggested, as I think the question is getting at, uh, a, a sense that nationalism d isn't connected to militarism or isn't about national expansion. Um, is that fair? <clears throat> expansion yes. is certainly part of the American <coughs> story. Excuse me. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, I, I think it is. And nationalism can easily fade. If, you know, ag aggressive and militaristic can fade into imperialism. Um, but there is a line there. You know, it's, uh, it's often fuzzy. 
Uh, but you know, I had had uh, inherited from um, my ancestral reading of National Review, you know, a germ of sympathy uh, for Western colonialism, especially British colonialism, which compared to other colonialisms was uh, more benign and had a liberalizing tendency. But I, I, I really think it's entirely mistaken. And uh, the, the far-sighted and correct posture is to be willing to let uh, peoples go their own way and be self-governing. And you know, FDR and Churchill had a big argument about this. You know, where FDR thought uh, Churchill was uh, positively Victorian, I think is the way he put it, on the, the question of colonialism. And and in my view, FDR was clearly right. Let's take another question up here. So it's just your posture on principle. You'll answer no questions when you're moderating. Pretty much, <laughs> yeah. But that was a very Berkian answer, so for what it's worth. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Mitsuo Nakai, a member of the Reagan Foundation. Uh, there are <laughs> dangers to both ends. Uh, nationalism may lead to isolationism, mm -hmm. which may lead to imperialism, because that's exactly what happened to Japan. Uh, mm -hmm. So we need to watch out. So my question is, uh, what are the differences? Uh, how do you distinguish all that three? Yeah, so <clears throat> I, I'm not sure I have a really satisfying answer on this. Um, again, <clears throat> excuse me, the, um, uh, our foreign policy should be national interest based. And then you have a big argument about uh, what that is. And some people will say it's more interventionist uh, than other people. I tend to think that the international institutions, we had such a big hand in <clears throat> developing in the post-World War II environment, profoundly serve our national uh, interest. And on any reasonable cost-benefit analysis uh, are much more of a benefit to the United States uh, than a cost. Um, but again, this just gets to how nationalism in of itself can't kind of settle a lot of these important policy questions. Just, just saying I'm a nationalist is not sufficient to tell you what the tax rates should be, you know, what your entitlement policy should be, and what your attitude towards NATO should be. I got, I got nothing for you, in other words. <laughs> <laughs> Let's take a question back then. Hi, uh, UT from the Washington Free Beacon. Um, so I just want to, I think you kind of touched upon the relationship between tribalism and cosmopolitanism, especially where, and how both seems to strive together in places um, uh, in, it, at the same time, like with Africa or the Middle East, where there's this pan-Africanism or pan-Arabism, and at the same time, there's this intense <coughs> corrosive tribalism, and both kind of roads at the national state. And in the case of even the developed world, like the Scottish separatists, they want to dissolve, they want to leave the United Kingdom, but they all want to join the EU. So what is there like a like a mutually reinforcing relationship between tribalism or cosmopolitanism? Is there a reason they coexist and thrive together? Um, I'm not sure. I, I see such a such a uh, relationship. I think <clears throat> probably kind of the pan African, pan Arab tendencies is a, uh, a symptom of a lack of a true nationalism uh, in those in those countries. Um, but uh, I, I don't see a relationship between, tri between tribalism and cosmopolitanism. Take one more question, uh, right over here. So you spoke a moment ago about trade policy and preferring American interests over others. Um, so that could kind of line up with the general Warren Cass argument about trade. Um, so if, if you accept that as a, a nationalist trade policy, taking an industrial policy, <clears throat> Um, how do you think about that tension with the traditional conservative sense of humility about what actually is best for American people in economic terms, even if, even if the industrial policy's t intent is to better American interests, um, the market being so complicated, um, the conservative humility would say maybe we shouldn't plan on that. Yeah, yeah so I, I wouldn't ac accept the premise that, uh, one, I didn't mean to endorse industrial policy. If, if I did, uh, I'm sorry. I'm on the free, free Beacon Do Not Report that I, <laughs> I just endorsed industrial policy. Uh, if I did, did I was <clears throat> unclear and I regret it. Um, but again, this just this goes to um, we should have policy 
that's in the interest of our own workers. And then you could have an argument over whether you, know, there, you should have an industrial policy or not on that basis. I tend to agree with where I think you're coming from. I'm skeptical about uh, big government uh, interventions, um, which are, are based on, as you correctly uh, point out, a fine-grained uh, understanding of what's uh, best for every single industry, what industry we should be supporting and, and not supporting. And the history of those sort of policies is not a happy one. And you know, it's been loosely tried in this, this country. You look at, look at the 1970s uh, when we saw various protectionist initiatives, which uh, the hi history of which is generally a, a failure. But to broaden that question, isn't it true that capitalism is almost inherently cosmopolitan? Is there, is there a capitalism in one nation that would go along with your nationalism? Well, I think capitalism does, it depends on rules, which are not uh, generally um, self-generating. Mm -hmm. And even trade policy, it's not like, uh, okay, we're going to have no rules with China, and then there's going to be free trade with China. That's just not, not how it works. You have to you have to uh, write it down, um, one. And two, um, I don't think you get democracy. Uh, I don't think you get markets. I don't think you get social trust without uh, nationalism in the sense of creating these uh, nation states, which to me are the most natural political entities. Um, now, Capitalism is going to tend towards uh, a sort of uh, tend towards an openness, but you need you need the, the nation to actually to pe for people to live in to actually have the government that's going to write the rules with another government uh, facilitating uh, the trade. So I, I just don't. It's it's just uh, there's just no such thing as like free fro floating libertarian people out in the ether. Like everyone belongs to something. Everyone lives uh, somewhere. And uh, everyone has to be governed, um, and, and there has to be uh, rules even for the market and for trade to work. Well, is that's that, a, is that an acceptable answer, Yuval? I, I, <laughs> hey, I'm not the, I, I think that's a great you place want, to You want to take answers or make any judgments. <laughs> exactly. Uh, yes, exactly. Just a neutral observer, Rich. Um, that is, though, a good place to end a discussion on nationalism and AI. Uh, let's thank Rich Lowry uh, very much thank for you. the book and for being with us. Rich is going to be outside uh, signing books, and uh, we have a little reception for you if you want to uh, bother him with more questions. And thank you all for being here. <laughs>